Oh, all right. Well, welcome to all of you, whoever you are. <laughs> this is I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will do the slightest bit of uh, repeating from last class. Um, today, it's largely a long um, lecture talking about the, sort of the nature of what was meant by Impressionism. And then I believe next class, we'll start I'll talk about Monet and, and move on into individual artists' careers. <clears throat> so the reprise is that um, the whole name of a movement called Impressionism is an artifact of a really ironical review written by this man named Louis Leroy of an exhibition that a group of artists were disgruntled that they just could not reach a public, an appreciative buying public for their work um, because they, um, although they from time to time had works shown in the salon, they never really got recognition there. So a group of primarily younger men then decided to form a cooperative, which just went by a very neutral name and an anonymous association, anonymous association of painters, sculptors, engravers, etc., and staged their own exhibition. And it, the features that were most important were that there were no judges for this, unlike the salon. So whoever was invited to join this association and accepted the invitation, as Manet never did, um, they were free to choose how many works and which works would be put in. I believe there was a stipulation that they could not simultaneously have something shown in the official, prestigious, massively attended annual salon <clears throat> staged by the French state at the uh, Ecole de Beaux-Arts. So the, this cluster of, of artists, um, many whose names have just gone into the dustbin of history, <clears throat> rented quarters in this studio of the photographer Nadar up here on the third floor. They got the whole space and they had an exhibition. They had it um, on one of the major new avenues and they had very long hours. So they hoped that people would come to see them, but they, they had fairly small attendance. <clears throat> and what, one thing that brought them to prominence was a review but written by this Louis Leroy. Now he wrote it for the magazine of um, caricatures, a very popular magazine at the time that Daumier um, did many of his, his um, cartoons for. Uh, <clears throat> it's just called the Chivalry. And this review I was reading through in its excruciating entirety to people because, uh, uh, well, there'll be <laughs> points to make, but then you have to imagine what it would be like to, to find this be the kind of recognition that your exhibition got. Um, I know nowadays the, the saying is, any publicity is better than none at all because people will say, oh, that name, I, I heard that name somewhere. Maybe I'll go check it out. And they won't remember whether it was something positive or something negative. But um, I want to uh, sort of bring attention to this, the, the, not so, even the tone of this, but the nature of the critique that Leroy makes of the exhibition. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing over again, but. Uh, a little from the introduction and a little of these specific paintings that he was talking about. Yes, we now say beautiful. Um, we'll find it's quite different for them, but Leroy, and he'd be speaking for, for multitudes, thought at the time uh, that he brought, the, the review is written as a, 
as a fantasy. It, it's a, it's a, an imagined dialogue between the writer and a, who was also trained as a painter and a friend of his who was a, uh, an award-winning, um, so an accepted artist. And they're going through and they make comments to one another as if they're just too murmuring as they go along. <clears throat> so this, this person that Leroy has invented for being his visitor, who's the most agitated by it, is a, um, called uh, Monsieur Vincent. Uh, and he said he'd come without uh, suspecting anything. He thought he'd see the kind of painting one sees everywhere, good and bad, rather bad than good. Well, already that's a pretty negative view, right? But not hostile to good painting, artistic matters, devotion to form and respect for the masters. So it should be, you want art to be acceptable to good artistic manners, whatever that is, devotion to form. That's going to mean that things are well drawn and uh, respect for the masters, that it should not be too revolutionary in any regard. It, it ought to show an awareness of the whole tradition of art and respect that and grow out of that. So they go in and the first thing they see is this painting by Renoir. And so Vincent says, oh, um, the painter has an understanding of color, but he, what a pity he doesn't draw better. His legs are as cottony as the gauze of her skirts. Well, unfortunately, I don't have a close up, but what this will be meaning is that the legs are not clearly outlined in that Ecole de Beaux-Arts um, profound, unquestioned belief that line is one of the most important aspects of a painting. Um, a considered careful line shows careful drawing and a figure that we show an understanding of anatomy. And it had this extra overtone of this being um, very rational. Um, because, you know, the truism, there is no such thing as a straight line in nature and there aren't very many lines in nature. There are edges, but there aren't lines. And um, so that's a part of that human imposition on the world, um, seeing lines and organizing things by lines. So oh, Renoir doesn't do that. And then this one was by Pizarro, it's a, called The Plowed Field. And so when this Mr. Vincent sees that, he, um, he thought his, his glasses were dirty. So he takes them off and wipes them and puts them back on his nose and he says, what on earth is that? Oh, it's a hoarfrost seen on plowed furrows. And that's, it's called a plowed field. He says, those furrows, that frost, but those are pallet scrapings uh, placed uniformly on a dirty canvas. So I, I even had a, a student who was unable to, to move beyond Leroy's point of view and hers. It was a, a, a kind of perceptual problem that she had, but it would have been a perceptual problem, very common at the time because this was such a, a novelty. What was seen were just dabs, all these little dabs of white and mm, orange and mm, scribblings up here for clouds, but it's largely these. I could not see it except for what it objectively was, dabs of color on the surface. He could not see that as representing something else um, because although hoarfrost is the snow is melting as the ice is melting, of course it will, there'll be places where it's melted and it's gone, so there's no white there. But um, this, um, This is where, in the last series I talked, there's a contemporary artist who, who deals with this, Vic Muniz. He says, you can look at a work either as a painting, as, or, or a sculpture either, as what it depicts, if it depicts something, even if it's just depicting emotion, or you see it for its material and the way the material is used. And here, so this artist is just seeing it. Monsieur Vincent is seeing it as material. 
And you see his hostility to it. He says that those are just scrapings off the artist's palette. And it's on a dirty canvas. So it doesn't even look like it's prepared well. Um, and then let's see. Let's go. Another artist, but that would be subject to the same thing. Um, and then this one, a view of Meloon by an artist who's now not well known as the painter. And he actually never was a, I guess you'd now call him almost a Sunday painter. He, um, he was an industrialist and he painted largely for his own pleasure. <clears throat> he says, oh, there's something very peculiar shadow. Well, you can't see exactly what the shadow, what's the cause of the shadow represented. I don't know. Do you see specific outlines in the, in the shadow? He says, and there's a vibration of tone. Now that means vibration of color. He says, oh, I call it sloppiness. And what are these mud splashes? So that's also objecting to the color and the treatment down here. And then uh, let's see, let's, let me take another one. So he rambles on, he goes along and he comes to Monet's view of um, fishing boats leaving the harbor at Le Havre. And Roy says he, he sort of um, rushed this Monsieur Vincent passed it so that he wouldn't see those noxious figures in the foreground. Um, now, what would make these noxious? They're not carefully outlined, are they? He just dabs a color black. But then he takes it in front of Monet's. View the Boulevard de Capuchin, which, which is actually the street in front of Nadar's show. And this would be as if these were men actually leaning out the windows from the exhibition and looking at what's out in the street. So this is one of those grand new splendid streets in Paris. These broad avenues with these new uniform uh, buildings along the side. And <clears throat> so to these people, this is what, Monsieur Vincent called them, they're innumerable black tongue lickings. So he's just seeing them as up and down repeated marks. Why, those are people walking along. Uh, so now I'm going into this. Um, then do I look like that when I'm walking along the boulevard? Blood and thunder. So you're making fun of me at least, last. I assure you, but those spots were obtained by the same method as that used to make imitate marble. A bit here, a bit there, slapdash, any old way. It's unheard of, appalling. Uh, I'll get a stroke from it for sure. So it's slapdash, not well considered, not exactly random, but um, pretty much like a faux marble might be random. That is another one. Could have been the one he saw. So then he saw, um, he tried to calm him by seeing this painting, um, but that was okay. But then, then the cabbages of Pizarro, this is the cabbages, stopped him as he was passing by and from red he became scarlet. Those are cabbages, I told him in a gently persuasive voice. Oh, the poor wretches, aren't they caricatured? I'm not sure I'll eat any more as long as I live. So these are the cabbages down here, of course. Of course, I say. Yet it's not their fault if the painter, be quiet or I'll do something terrible. Suddenly he gave a loud cry upon catching sight of the house of the hanged man by Monsieur Cezanne. The stupendous imposture. Now that means thickly built up paint, as you can certainly see, even in this reproduction. Um, let's see. What was this? The, uh, of the, the stupendous imposture of this little jewel uh, uh, accomplished the work by the boulevard. Father Vincent became delirious. At first, his madness was fairly mild. 
Taking the point of view of the Impressionists, he let himself go along their, their lines. And we'll come back to what, what he means by, there the word Impressionist appears. Um, then he sees this by an artist named Boudin, B-O-U-D-I-N, who was one of Monet's teachers. And Monet had made sure he was invited to be in this exhibition. He said, now, Boudin has some talent, he remarked, but why does he fiddle so with his madness? And that's because he showed several paintings of the same area. Um, oh, you consider his painting too finished? Unquestionably. Now take Mademoiselle Morisot. That young lady is not introducing in uh, reproducing trifling details. When she has a hand to paint, she makes exactly as many brush strokes lengthwise as there are fingers. And the business is done. Stupid people are finicky about drawing of a hand. Remember that was one of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts exercises was to learn how to draw a hand. Um, stupid people who are finicky about the drawing of a hand don't understand a thing about Impressionism. And the great Manet would chase them out of his mind. Republic. Now, the great Manet would be furious with this review because he never associated himself with these people. And that term Impressionism, he was their good friend. He probably helped them formulate many of their ideas. And he works with them for a little while, but he was never the ringleader, um, as he was often credited as being or discredited as being. Then Monsieur Renoir is following the proper path. Well, here's another more. So you can see somewhat closer. These are both in that exhibition um, that she's fairly, well, I wouldn't consider it extremely summary in the way she represents parts. This is by Renoir. Then Monsieur Renoir is following the proper path. There's nothing superfluous in the harvesters. I'd almost say that his figures are, now this is, Monsieur Vincent says this again, are even too finished. Oh, Monsieur Vincent, but do look at these three strips of color, which are supposed to represent a man in the middle of the wheat. And I think that's referring to this figure, black, that, that. It might be this one. Oh, there are two too many. One would be enough. I glanced at Mr. Vincent. His countenance was turning to a deep red. A catastrophe seemed to me imminent. And it was reserved for Monsieur Monet to contribute the last straw. Ah, oh, there he is. There he is, he cried. Impression. Because that was the title. Impression. Summarize. I was certain of it. I was just telling myself that since I was impressed, there had to be some impression in it. And what freedom, what ease of workmanship. A preliminary drawing for a wallpaper pattern is more finished than that, than this seascape. I will stop and say what impression meant generally at that time. Um, they were sanctioned and the impression would be an artist's first immediate response to something put down very quickly. And then that could be the basis later for a work of art, but would never be considered, it, it would be authentic and it would be intimate, but it would never be a finished work of art. And the reason Monet entitled this impression Sunrise was that it was time for the catalog to be printed for the show. And he didn't have a title for it because he, he was never really interested in titles. So he just offhandedly said, I'll call it Impression Sunrise because it is the sunrise in the harbor at Le Havre. And you see industry over here, the massive ship and the derricks. So out of this man's unintended, <laughs> the comments in his, his review and the back of the hand titling of this painting, we get our, our term and our, our whole concept of Impressionism. But then he goes on. 
Uh, in vain, I sought to revive his expiring reason, but the horrible fascinated him. The laundress, so badly laundered, a Monsieur Degas, drove him to his cries of admiration. And this is a little tiny painting, it's about 10 inches high. Um, and then, To indulge his insanity and out, fear of, and out of fear of irritating him, I looked for what would be tolerable among these paintings. And I acknowledged without too much difficulty that the bread, grapes, and chair of breakfast by Monsieur Monet, it's sometimes called luncheon or breakfast, were good bits of painting. But he rejected these concessions. No, no, Monet is weakening here. He's sacrificing to the false gods of um, an artist who was a very finished artist. Too finished, too finished. Talk to me of the modern Olympia. That's something well done. And now this is uh, Leroy talking. Alas, go and look at it. A woman folded in two from whom a Negro girl is removing the last veil in order to offer her in all her ugliness to the charmed gaze of a brown puppet. Do you remember the Olympia of Manet? Of course, that had been a scandal about 10 years before. Well, that was a masterpiece of drawing accuracy and finish compared to the one by Cezanne. Cezanne always carried a little reproduction, a photograph of Manet's Olympia around with him. And this is a kind of witty rejoinder to it. And we'll come back to this. Finally, the picture ran over. The classic skull of Pierre Vincent, Father Vincent here, the order, assailed from too many sides, went completely to pieces. He paused before the municipal guard who watches over all these treasures and taking him to be a portrait began for my benefit a very emphatic criticism. And so it goes on and on and on. Um, so in the end, um, this father Dinsip begins to dance the scalp dance in front of the guard, crying in a strangled voice. Ha ha, I'm an impression on the march, the avenging pellet knife, the boulevard of Monet, the house of the hangman, and the modern Olympian of Cezanne. Ha ho, ha ho. And that was the review. Well, he did have the taste to single out, or this is what history has done. The ones that he singled out are the ones that are the best known now as impressionists of the large uh, group of artists in that show. So in... Um, uh, of course, I, I gave this away <laughs> at the start, telling you to what to listen for as I um, read through his review, that his comments are about um, the execution of the paintings. Um, he doesn't make any comments about the subject matter, which is in itself something to notice because according to the strict uh, academies point of view, the Salon's point of view of the past, the traditional idea is that art is there to elevate, ennoble, inspire, instruct. It always has a purpose very, very low on a, a list of things a work of art should do is to um, please by being decorative. But that attitude had been changing since about the middle of the 19th century. Some of that change is maybe due to the fact that um, the art, the public was changing as it was no longer so much a well-educated, well-bred um, aristocracy or upper middle class, but more and more the new rich, the people who are coming in from the country, the formerly uh, minimally educated people who were much, would be bewildered by um, the meaning of some of the paintings of the more arcane classical myths, say, um, but were um, 
quite enchanted by seeing the world around them represented in painting, and especially on a fairly small scale, so that these were paintings that represented a world that was around them. And that's a cliche about how more materialistic the middle class is always, no matter what the culture. Uh, that they looking at the world around them, um, and that these would be also smaller paintings, because these were all smaller, all, almost all of them were smaller, uh, of the kind that they could afford to buy, so that they could be decorative in their homes. So then I thought, well, let's just look at the range of subjects in these works that, that Leroy is getting agitated by. There's just a view of the outside world, That's a, the Boudin landscapes. The, the Normandy coast where people were now beginning to go for vacations because it was a train that took them right up there. Or the rural villages, the hamlets like this one done by Cezanne. So that's um, perhaps the kind of landscapes in the countryside from which many of the people came. That's the traditional old France. Or there was one of the absolutely brand spanking new modern urban environments. So you have a nature, nature, uh, country, inhabited place, and then an urban world. Or workers, peasants at work, by Renoir, by Cicely. Cicely himself was very much always involved in political movements and uh, the plight of the poor, and the peasants. Or here there's um, signs of, I guess I'd, I'd put it more with urban industry and commerce. A uh, little tugboat back here, a lot of these. Uh, bringing goods for Paris. And these are new tall buildings sprung up around the harbor. So that's also fully contemporary. Or this on the banks of the Seine, this is just the scene now with factories spewing smoke, a tugboat with its smoke, somebody fishing, this is kind of probably work here. It's just the workaday ordinary suburban world. and the world of women, uh, women of the middle, upper middle class would be the, the world that um, Bert Morisot now knew. This is her sister who, with her baby. Um, and there would of course be a nursemaid who took care of the baby, but she's here gazing at her lovely little child. Or her sister and her mother reading. So it's an indoor, educated, sort of confined world. Or uh, also the domestic world here. This is uh, Monet's wife and son in a slightly more bourgeois setting. And the work of working girls. So dance was certainly work, as was being a laundress. So it, uh, he happened to pick out works that illustrate how Impressionism, these artists are absolutely showing the world of their own time. We look back on them now and they're, um, they're so much in the past that they're, they sort of evoke a kind of nostalgia or we don't think of them as being glaringly in your face, this is right now. Um, so what made it possible for them to accept that? As I say, it, it, it had been growing in the, since about 1850 and because of this man who also was very powerfully influential upon the Impressionists. And that was Gustave Courbet, whom I discussed in the um, previous set of lectures, but he was, the artist who in his writing and in his paintings and in his um, in the work of his colleague Baudelaire, who you see over here, um, said that what you should paint is not 
the ideal, not the past, the heroic past, um, but the real and now. And this was his painting of the artist's studio, which could hardly be seen as real and now because these are a, an ama amassing of all sorts of figure types from the past. And these are his friends over here. And what's he painting is that landscape. Landscapes and realism come in right in the middle of the 19th century. But Courbet, um, let's, let's get just for the sake of a look at it detail where he's painting a landscape. You see, he's, even the way he sits, you have the sense that he's a man well aware of his own talents. <clears throat> but um, Courbet's point of view uh, was that anything that appears in the newspaper is a fit subject for a painting because it is part of the world. And if we are painting the world, why not have it in a painting? I mean, what a painting reflects the can reflect uh, everything. And now that's what his friend Baudelaire said also. And Baudelaire's writing were influential in the way that Courbet's painting were. Because Courbet, in response to two reviews of exhibitions, wrote essays. Uh, one in the middle of the century was about um, on the modern painter. And then there was one on reality. Was like, first of all, he's saying he, he coined the term modernity. And you, if you come up with a word, it means you've also uh, formalized a concept that idea of the newness and the nowness. And for Baudelaire and his, he says, for example, there is beauty in today. You know, it's not just in the past. We have yet to formulate what it is. Maybe it's the men in their black frock coats. Maybe that is the beauty of today. The artist needs to look around and find it in the now. And then about a decade later, he writes another similarly, um, well, it would be inspiring, but it's also coming out of the discussion with these men who were inspired as well, these artists, um, was the idea, well, what is another aspect of modernity? It is change. Well, we still talk about that for modernity, right? It's change and flux and things are always changing. Uh, in Paris, you know, the new roads going up where there used to be slums, and now you can what used to take a day's trip, you can take a train and you can do within a few hours. Um, people who all their lives lived in the country now come to the city. Uh, we operate by clocks instead of by the sun. That it was fast paced, frantic. Everything is moving, you go down the street, you see people you don't know, you pass by them, you only get a glimpse of them. So that was something the artists ought to capture. And the other thing that Courbet did that was so influential, especially on this, the young group for 1874, is that when he had completed that painting of the artist's studio, he submitted it to be shown in the 1855 World's Fair in Paris, where there was a big section devoted to French painting. And it was rejected possibly because it's such a huge painting because it, it's very big. Um, but what Courbet did with the, his family's money and he had a very wealthy donor who backed him. He built his own private pavilion right alongside to show his own work. So he's one of the first men to just take it upon himself to find a way to show his work. I don't have that there right there. Oh, okay. So the other aspect that I wanted. To, so impressionism, there's not much of this, this new style. There's not an objection to subject that's accepted. And there's nothing that the impressionists do that are, is particularly new in terms of subject. 
But as I said, it's in the execution of the work of art. And so here, this is another uh, aspect of context and background um, in which to think of this work. Because it wasn't a total novelty for all Leroy's Monsieur Vincent is saying <clears throat> about the cottony legs on Renard's da dancer, to have things loose and spontaneous uh, was accepted and even accepted in the academy, but in a very bounded uh, way. I mean, it was pigeonholed. So I just want to take you through this, um, well, this generally through the whole 19th century, a, a kind of a struggle going on. It was between the sketch and the finished painting. Because um, a great thinker in the 17th century had said, no, I, well, I'm not gonna get the quote out right now, but it says like, why is it that people uh, prefer looking at sketches to final paintings? That's not to say that that makes the, the final painting worse, but just that people like looking at the sketches. So that was the issue. So we're gonna look at the way sketches were handled. Um, first in the, all throughout the 19th century, all fledgling artists, painters, um, and I think this goes on in many art schools. I know it was at William Patterson um, <clears throat> in the art department, it's still true. There was a kind of drawing that everyone was um, taught, not that kind of precise outline drawing as uh, from the models, plaster casts or from living models, but uh, it, it was called a croquis. Um, it's C-R-O, Q-U-I-S, and um, it's a kind of automatic drawing, not in the 20th century sense, but um, that the, the person would take a pencil primarily, um, look at something and then draw it without ever looking down to see what was appearing on the piece of paper, that you're working so that you are getting developing a kind of a muscle memory of strokes and how to draw a figure. So you you do them over and over and over again. So the training between your eye and your hand means that you get something that's produced at the end. You can do swiftly without even looking. And that finally, uh, as here you can see by the late 1880s. Those croquis were, were <laughs> getting a lot of respect. Um, this is by Daumier, and this is a lithograph. So this is made for publication and then made in multiples because people would buy it. And it was the uh, automatic drawings that he was doing in preparation for a series about judges and um, just called advocates. And, and so you can see it's a repeated loose fluid line sketching in the edges while he sees someone and he's sort of capturing and caricaturing um, their, um, their pose, their look. Well, here's one from 1830 by Delacroix. Um, let's see if I'm getting, no, I've moved on to the next category. The, the, so there's the croquis and then there's the sketch. And this is a sketch, or an esquisse. Uh, a sketch was thought of as, um, the artist it works very rapidly and of impulse out of himself or herself, putting down the first idea for something is often not from looking at anything as you did in a croquis, but rather your first idea of uh, what you want to represent. And this is, it's now turned into a, a framed work, but it was originally, of course, not meant to be, to be seen by anybody. Um, Delacroix's um, sketch for Liberty leading the 
people from 1830. So this was admired. We say, oh, you can see the man. In the sketch, you can see a person's personality, his genius, uh, the impulsive way he's working. So this is at the, the core, the genesis of the work of art. But it would not be ever on display originally. And that's what Cezanne even labeled this as one of those sketches and esquisse. Now, this one in color, how do you know? I mean, he's, he, he makes it unmistakable that he's doing something really quickly because this is oil paint. Now, oil paint is slow to dry. And that means um, what he has to do is almost nowhere overlap colors where they could get muddy. See how it doesn't come to the edge? It doesn't match there. He doesn't merge the green and the blue. The black, which can cover everything, that comes at the end. But he's making it very obvious to you that he's working so rapidly, he's not having to wait for the paint to dry. And there are places where he has almost no color down. So this is that first idea. Uh, no wonder, um, you know, I think I did mention last, no, well, maybe I didn't about, um, couldn't have, about this painting, this sketch when Cezanne put it in, that um, Monet Renoir and the others who were in the, in the organizing committee for that exhibition had a lot of, um, reservations about even allowing this, despite their saying, you know, each artist gets to choose. And, and, and Degas had to just remind them, you know, that that, that was part of the original um, the framework of this, that each person got to choose, so they had to accept it. But they knew this would be, you, you didn't show, you didn't show things like this. And then there were studies, the etudes. Now, by the 1870s, even in the salons, sometimes an artist, especially a landscape artist, would show his etude right alongside the finished painting. An etude was a study uh, of some aspect of what was going to be in a final work of art. And for the landscapists, like Corot, who did this one, this is in the Met of oak trees that are in, in Fontainebleau, um, doing this on a small surface, because you just go with a, a portable paint box, and um, this much would fit inside the paint box even. And you, you do it, what you're doing is, uh, you can see places of canvas isn't all covered here. He, he's trying to, he does it to sort of register what in the landscape, the colors, the exact tone of the colors under certain light conditions. So, and, just uh, sort of some forms that gather the right color for the sky, for the land, for the trees. And then it bring you'd bring your landscape etude back to the studio and uh, use them as references, perhaps, uh, for the, the combination of hues. Or you might take the whole group and work it over into a finished painting. And in this case, it went into a finished painting that's in the mat also. Here it is. So it could be absorbed into a final work. So that was a study. Here's another painting by Courbet from the middle 1850s of uh, young ladies. Now young ladies, we ought to put in, in parentheses because they're, they would at the time have been obvious to everyone as being two young prostitutes along the banks of the Seine. What makes this, one of the things for which this painting is known is more to Courbet's fame. That's the first painting that shows people just out enjoying themselves 
uh, in Leisure Along the Seine, a scene that's so common in Impressionist art. So these two young women, this one I want to make sure you understand, she's wearing just her petticoats. She's taken off her dress, which is underneath her. And here's a study done for that foreground woman. You see, he's just using, just brushing in this, getting down the idea he has a model posed for him. And one, thing, one other thing I want to mention right here, because this Leroy does not get agitated about, but was agitating to people, other people, was that um, about the colors, that the colors were absolutely too bright in their paintings. Because here, Courbet is, is, although this is just a study, is working in a traditional way, where he worked for, from a canvas that he had darkened um, actually, Courbet sometimes put up sort of like a bitumen, it's like pitch, a, a black on the, on the underneath, and then you build up your colors on that. So there's even when there's skin here, uh, in the shadows, some of that gray, the darkness of the bitumen comes through. There's a, a lurking um, somberness to the colors. Whereas Monet, here, this is a woman along uh, banks of the Seine at Benacourt from the 1860s, not too many years later than uh, Courbet's. Um, he's working in a new way. So was uh, Cezanne. No underpainting, no preparation of the canvas before. When you bought it from the dealer, it might have a light soaking of uh, a beige or a slight cream or slightly more pinkish color in it. Uh, but you did not put down an undertone. And so all the colors of above it are lighter. And the colors are lighter because these are now the new synthetic colors, new on the market. Manet especially loves this. Monet, not Monet, this blue, because blues had been, other than hugely expensive ultramarine, which is uh, ground up lapis lazuli, a very um, fugitive color. Uh, not too many years and it started to change into other colors. And greens were also very difficult. They turned into blacks. So these greens and blacks, and some of these colors are new. So there's an underlying lightness and there's a lightness because there are now new lighter hues available because they're synthetic paints. They're still oils, but they're synthetic. Give you a, in a moment an even better example, maybe for looking at this. Now, this one you could see why it would be called an impression, and this is something that this group of artists takes as a basic tenet of the way they approach what they do. Um, I didn't bring in a work by Degas at this time, um, but we'll see Degas. Um, follows the same principle, but he executes it in a different way. And that is that you need this to be fleeting, like an impression. It's something you do quickly. And this has something that actually had, especially, why don't we go back to Corot. This is something that was coming up as in the 60s, maybe especially, these landscape artists going out in the country and painting, that's called in front of the motif. This is plein air, it's, it's outdoor painting. They're not doing this in the studio. 
um, when they're just sitting there, even if you're working very rapidly, there's a limit to how fast you're going. And you would be aware that as clouds cross over the sun, as the time of day changes, the colors you're looking at, the hues you look at change and the shadows move. So you're no longer looking at the same thing again. Now, if an impression is to be your immediate response to something you see right in front of you, you can't labor over it. Uh, there's someone in the 1880s that finally says, an impression has to be done within 15 minutes. There is too much change in the world. And aha, that change you see is flux, which is Baudelaire saying that is the aspect of modernity. So nature is in flux. Human society is in flux. People moving on the streets in the city are in flux. And that is what Impressionist wants to capture. So they're painting, they say, wholly outdoors, being true to what they see, um, showing, now an impression also is not meant to be, and this is how Leroy was using it, is not uh, meant to be um, absolutely faithful to the objective truth. It is the artist's perception. It's, artist's reaction to it. And we react quickly. So that's another reason that it's done quickly. It changes, the artist changes. <clears throat> so you have to paint quickly. Easy, much easier now that they have acrylic paints, which are fast drying. In oil paints, not so easy. One thing that, well, especially Monet, other artists will do too. They use wide brushes. And they use color, not mixed, not dilute. And you see each brush. Went here, went there. Oh, here, this one. That blue was already there. And then just the side of the brush, just a little color went over there. You see this yellow went right over the green. So that green, it, it just kind of loaded the brush because it'd be all muddy through here. It just sort of danced over the top there. And look how this color is put next to this color. Not, they don't merge. It's a patch of color, another patch of color. Here, why green? Well, that's a reflection of the um, trees in this sort of. And you see, this is where Leroy and Monsieur Vincent are having such trouble because all they see are these brush strokes, the quick stroke, fleck of black, fleck of black here. Quickly put in, Monet's terrible with figures. Uh, he, he never, I think he left um, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts before the he master figure studies. So he, he, he tends to do them in an especially summary way. But look at this, just, Squiggle, squiggle. These leaves, just sort of almost dabbing them on there, putting the end of a thick brush on just straight down. So you see all of the technique and that's desired because that's the artist showing himself. It was, has been um, taken by many for a long time and Monet certainly, until late in his life, um, fostered the belief that this was truth, that these were done just in a short time out of doors. And he would, uh, we know that sometimes later on when he does series of something, he will take a number of canvases because they're small, small canvases. You have to be if you're going to get this done in one sitting. Um, he, and he'd have them, He'd start one and when the light changed too much, he'd go to another one. And then when the light returned to those conditions, maybe another day, he might come back to it. But so there's that, that impetuosity, that speed. Um, 
with the virtue of modern um, uh, conservation and study of these and looking beneath the surface of the painting, sometimes it's clear that what has happened is, for example, a whole area has been scraped off and repainted. So it has been adjusted later on in the studio. Uh, it's not all done on the spot, but it's designed to look as if it were. So it's to give the impression of almost instantaneous working. Certainly this is instantaneous here. That's the sunlight coming down from the lead, between the leaves. And I think these last few minutes will just give you, um, because I have a close-up of where, where you can see this, um, uh, it's a, a memory of a, a, a moment in 1874 when Monet and his wife, uh, Camille, and their son, uh, Claude, had, um, were renting a property in Argenteuil, which is just easy train ride outside Paris, 20 minute ride, um, and uh, where Monet could have his garden because, you know, he always his love his gardens. And Monet and he was staying at a family property just opposite side, opposite the bank of the river there. And so they, they got together often during the summer of 1874 and worked together. And this is the painting by Monet, whose signature you see down here, of Monet working in the garden with his wife and son and the chick and hen and rooster. And you see how quickly this is working. Now we know that Monet did a painting of Monet at the same time that one has been lost. But this is for a while, Monet does uh, follow what the Impressionists are doing. He, he works quite a bit in the same way. Now this is a, you'd never guess, this is more accurate color from this dark one, but I wanted you to get a close up so you see him too, single dashed strokes. Paints a little thicker there, a little bit scrubs there. And Renoir came a little bit later in the afternoon and got involved. And Renoir did one too just of Madame Monet and their son. The difference in the artist is pretty clear in that Monet is more interested in the person, the human interaction. He's, he's very interested in people, not really interested in the countryside. Here she's just clearly posing, but I have a great one for this. And this is what roused either inspiration or vehement objection. Look at look at all that bare canvas there. You could count the strokes. You can recreate the painting just as easily as you can see that's a little boy. Well, I will um, stop there. And next time, um, there's no way we can see a, a, a great many of any one of these artists because if you're working quickly and you're working small, they turned out an enormous number of paintings. But um, next, uh, next week we'll look just at the work of Monet. And if you have questions or you want me to go back to anything, please, please ask. Nay. Yeah.
it's Carolyn. Um, yes. Do I understand that that the that the middle class accepted this kind of painting, but the upper class was oh, thank you. No, no, it was even it was every bit as bad for the middle class. And on uh, um, part of the thing, you know, it's the same issue that non-representational art. How can they tell if it's any good? You can't, as you could with the Boucherot, done it exactly this time, same time. You know, no one's pulling the wool over your eye there. Look, has that man, he, he has mastered the technique. You can see, I mean, oh, I could never do something like that. That's real art. How would you know that about this? And there were, it, it took a lot of people a long time to see that that was, uh, literally they could not see that that would be a boy here. They would see pink, yellow, thick pink, sloppy, sloppy. But who would say that it was sloppy? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Oh, that would be the people who wouldn't buy these. And that's what Leroy and his, who's his writing this review as if he were um, a middle-class observer. These are tongue lickings and palate scrapings. And, you know. So when you started, you started with that, that girl's leg. Now, who would have criticized that? That's just this, that was in the same review written for that show. Um, that was, because that wasn't well drawn. That was, that was a, that ballet figures by Renoir. And he said, oh, it's just cotton because it's fluffy. There's no edge. It's not, look at this, clear edges. Oh, oh, that looks like hair. That doesn't look like a stroke of broad brush just flashing down a piece of color. This is magic. That's painting. This is painting? Does that answer? I mean, there were many other artists and you know, there were many other different kinds of art also at this time, but, mm, and, and an artist like Delacroix, they had already done a sort of more fluid work but um, these men are going much further with it than anybody had it before. That's because they're not, quote, finishing it. But you see, these are finished in the no, I know they are, but I'm saying, is that what people are saying? They're not. Absolutely, finished. yes. These are unfinished. And, in, and so in the sense they were, insulted by them because, because they go as people go to be elevated, to be instructed, to get something from art. What were they to get out of this? Anybody else? Yes, I'll ask about something. Please uh, do. What do you think could be the contemporary modern equivalent to our eyes of something that had the, the shock value to them of these Impressionist paintings compared to what they were used to? Like for us, is it like seeing Warhol's tomato cans and calling it art or Pollock or... I Maybe. think that would have been absolutely they in their day were and what is now I'm not sure because uh, I still I have this suspicion that art critics are so afraid of looking like chumps like Leroy looks to us now that they're much more willing to see value in everything. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly both Pollock 
I would say abstract expressionism face, face this kind of same kind of incomprehension, yeah. I also wondered, did the did all those artists in that first show, did they have to pay to be part of it, to cover yes, the- Yes, they did. And they most of them were spent the whole rest of the year paying it off, the amount they owed. Yep. Okay, well, from that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>